Imagine losing your dad at age three, being sent to military school, and things going downhill from there. This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my very special guest is writer-producer John Callis. We're going to talk about his autobiography and also his Christmas novel right here on Guys Guys TV right now. You can also catch me on Guys Guys Radio on KCAA in Southern California and also my worldwide podcast, Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio. Thanks for your support. This episode of Guys Guy Radio includes discussion of sensitive topics. Listener discretion is advised. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, I've got a special guest today. We're going to talk about what it's like to be a young man growing up in today's world without your dad. My special guest, his name is John Callis. He's a uh, well-known name in Hollywood in that he's an Emmy Award nominated writer, director, producer in the Hollywood entertainment business. He recently wrote and directed festival award-winning feature film called No Solicitors, starring Eric Roberts, who's been a guest on Guys Guys Radio. He's adapted New York Times best-selling author William Labarge's, Labarge's novel, Lightning Strikes Twice. John's written works, he's written some novels on his own, Christmas Voices, Secrets, When the Rain Stops, which is his autobiography that we're going to get in today, No Solicitors, and First Time Parents Guide to Unnecessary and Wild Spending. John's worked in a lot of different aspects and areas in Hollywood, including acting, production, directing. Uh, he worked at Disney, and he really knows the ropes, and uh, he's got a lot of uh, uh, integrity in the business where it can be a disingenuous business. And we'll get into that, but we want to talk about guys, and we want to talk about young men and what it's like to be a boy who loses his dad, because there's so many families nowadays where young boys don't have dads. So let's start right at the beginning by welcoming my special guest, John Callis to Guys Guys Radio. Welcome, John. Thank you, Robert, and thank you for having me on. Okay, let's talk about um, what's happened to you. So you wrote this book. It's called When the Rain Stops. It's an autobiography. You were three years old. Your dad passed, and um, you had a rough and tumble childhood, got a lot of anger issues, got into a lot of fights and stuff. You get sent to military school. It's really trying. Instead of fixing the problem, in some ways, it seems like it made it worse. But somehow you got through it. You got through the relationship with your mother. You got through your relationships with women and men. And, and you became a success. And it's a, a very inspirational story. And I'm sure you've had some interesting experiences uh, along the way. But when you lost your dad, losing him stirred up a lot of feelings in you, which is totally understandable for anybody who's lost their father. Um, as part of that, what was the inspiration and was that the sole inspiration for writing this book? Well, <clears throat> I think losing a father at an early age certainly sets traumas and anger and for me anyway, anxiety and all sorts of things. Um, I, I really wanted to write this book to help other people realize that they're not alone in their struggle. Other people are going through very similar things and offering a path to come out of it. I'm not saying my path is going to be for everybody, but at least they'll see there are different ways and different baby steps to take, um, accepting help from others and seeking out help because you can't do this alone. So I wrote this book in, in hopes of if I save one person's life, I'll consider it a best-selling novel. Well, it's got a very inspirational message and you, uh, you bear it all. And I've got to think it was a very cathartic experience just getting this down out of you and getting it down on paper because you made friends, you lost friends, you lost your dad, you had uh, really traumatic issues in terms of your initiation to sex with, with uh, women, you had some issues with military school with some of the, <laughs> with some of the uh, leadership there, quote unquote. Uh, how cathartic was this experience of putting all this down on paper? It was painfully cathartic. And the only way I was able to do it is to be honest enough to rip off the scabs and look at those experiences I had, which is why I did the double voice. I, I wanted to frame it from the person living the experience and then have a little bit of a perspective of the adult looking back at it and giving a better understanding of what was really going on, not what I perceived as going on. Mm -hmm. And the name of the book is called When the Rain Stops and it's John's autobiography. Um, you had a lot of anger issues. Um, did that stem from your father passing or were you kind of an angry kid and were there other reasons why you were angry and I say this if I'm incorrect just correct me but it seems like there was a lot of anger because you were fighting all the time well I think the trigger point was the death of my father because I just I lost my faith I, I screamed at God telling him f you you know how could you take my dad away 
And then I had to start dealing with kids at school saying, you know, this weekend I'm going to go play ball with my dad. What are you doing? So I'd make up stories. And so I'd come home all frustrated that I didn't have a dad. And there was no guidance. My mother was trying to raise three kids in a um, economically uh, and uh, poor neighborhood. So she had to work all the time. So we were kind of left with ants and whoever was around to fend for ourselves. And it was not a friendly environment to grow up in. So the anger became like a street kid in New Jersey. You know, you had to fight to survive. And uh, with my anger about losing my dad, it was a natural place for me to put my anger. So when you got to uh, military school, uh, it seemed like that was a real um, pail of cold water in the face and not necessarily in a great way, but you got through and it seemed like you learned a lot. Can you kind of encapsulate for us what that experience was like arriving there you know, by yourself as uh, how, you, you were about, how old were you when you went to the military school? 12. Okay, so that's a really developmental key uh, age for the development of a boy into a man. So you get there and they, uh, you're not ready for it and you're kind of a rebel and they kind of kick your butt around and, um, and more. Uh, and a lot of the experiences weren't so pleasant. So tell us about a little bit about how that affected you and how you got through that. Well, I have to start at the fact that I was put on a train in New York City to go to Virginia to a military school alone. So on top of all my anxiety, my depression, everything, I now had another key, which was uh, abandonment. So I was terrified going uh, on the train. Um, I just wanted to go home. I wanted to be tucked in bed. And uh, it was really a terrifying experience. And the three years were terrifying. And I had to fight tooth and nail not to lose who I was because military school definitely puts you in a certain mindset. Now, having said that, there was a side benefit to military school that which only later in life I realized, which is it gave me a discipline that is very strong. If I need discipline, I can tap into that kind of mindset and get through things that I need to do. And so I'll give kudos there. The rest of the experience, no thank you. Now, without naming names or even the name of the school or anything, it seems like there are some of the people in supervisory positions were a bit predatory on the uh, young fellows there. And um, I guess they all kind of took it in different ways. And you were like, hey, no way. How, what, was, what, sh what was your take on that then? And what's your take on that now? That's a great question because it left me with more sexual scars because I was 12 years old. I hadn't even reached puberty and I, I didn't know what I was doing. I knew that it didn't feel right to me. And I felt that these people were really, as you said, predators. And I just kept running away from school and kept being dragged back. And it was, it was pretty horrible back then. And I became very homophobic. Um, I used to call them fags and queers and everything else until I went to a gay club in New York with my sister's friend. And she said, will you be comfortable here? I said, I'm comfortable myself, Let, let's do it. And this gay guy sat next to me and wanted me to dance. I said, no, and he goes, you're straight, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I am. And for about 30, 40 minutes, we sat and talked. And I just realized from this kind human being, it didn't matter whether he was gay, black, white, green, blue or purple. There was a human being in there with all the feelings I had and with feelings that of love for his fellow men. And the, I couldn't find justification in, in not recognizing that and being so grateful that this guy took the time to talk to me. And so I'm no longer homophobic, obviously, and I support the complete gay scene. Um, I think everyone's entitled to love, and no matter how they choose it, uh, as long as we respect each other's space and, and don't impose on each other, I think it's, it's only fair that everyone has equal rights healthcare, all the things that are due to us as human beings, not whether you're gay, not whether you're black or white or anything else. So I, I'm a real proponent of, of equality in that area. Okay, and we're not, we're not um, uh, painting the entire military school, uh, it, you know, institutions across the board in any way. This is your personal experience that you uh, articulated in, in your book. So, Correct. And you did get some positives. The discipline, I guess, that your parents or your, not your mom was looking for, for you to get, it, it seemed like from reading the book that you, you did some of the things, uh, you picked up some things that ha have helped you until up until this day. Is that true, John? Uh, it's very true. As I mentioned, the whole discipline thing has been very instrumental because 
you know, I'm an artist and obviously artists tend to be a little wacky uh, by, by admission. Um, but when I have to get disciplined, um, I, I'm very good at it. And I'm kind of a little bit of an anomaly in my area of filmmaking in that I can actually work both sides of the brain. I can produce and get all the numbers because money doesn't bother me. I don't, it's just a number and it has to be spent in certain categories and I'm, I'm fine with all that. And then the creative side to direct, um, I can put that part of the money thing aside and just look at the creative aspect. So I've, I think that that was a real benefit that I can divide my brain in half and the discipline is from the military school. And just as a side note, what you said before was very important. This is my personal experience in military school. There were other kids there that absolutely had a great time, went off to West Point, became military leaders, and you know, bless them. I, I hold no grudge that way. It's it was my path that I went through that that certainly contributed to my uh, responses I was getting as a, as a young boy. I was a smart ass, and you know, I got beat because of it, not because it was some jolly thing in it. They wanted to discipline me, mm -hmm. and it just wasn't working. I just couldn't deal with it it seems like uh, sexual sex and sexuality also played a role in your um, coming of age in that your first sexual experience with a, a girl she was more of the aggressor and you were you were uncomfortable and then you had your military school experience and that's kind of a you got a kind of a double whammy as your in initiation into the you know the adult world of sexuality um is is that true and how has that impacted you to this day without you know, you don't have to go too deep into it, but it seemed like that was an underlying theme in there, that there was some issues there that you had to experience, not your issue, particularly as a human being, but, you know, issues that you became um, apparent because of your experiences. Very true. Um, I think there's a misconception that men can't be raped. We can. And I was raped by this girl. There's no question about it. And it left more um, confusion in my mind about women because I got scared. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I, I, I didn't know the feelings that I was having. She took advantage of, you know, well, aren't you a man? Don't you like my breasts and this kind of stuff? And so that kind of started a, a role where I wasn't really sure to trust women. And then when I got to military school, I saw the opposite side of not trusting men. So I'm kind of like the donkey in the middle of two haystacks. You know, you can start today. You know, are you gay? Are you straight? You know, what you're feeling? And I was so scared. I didn't know what to do until I met this woman in college who took me through the woman's body from head to toe because she saw the fear I had and she calmed me down and taught me about women, uh, their body, what to do, what not to do, how to approach it. And to this day, I bless her because from that moment forward, I started to develop much healthier uh, mindset about sexuality. Mm -hmm. Another uh, issue that comes up in, the, in your experience in the book, John, is, is bullying. And I think that's prevalent, still prevalent, unfortunately, uh, a disease in our culture nowadays. And uh, I found it very interesting because you were quick to fight back uh, in many of your experience until you ran into this one kid, this bigger kid. And uh, he really got under your skin and really kind of became a pain in the neck for you for uh, quite a long time. And I was like, when is he going to do something? Because I saw, saw you as you and, the, and as the character you uh, as being a fighter. And yet in this case, you just refused. I, a, it seemed like you were trying to try things a different way, try things a different way, try things a different way. And then eventually, you know, you kicked his butt and then things smoothed out. W what was that like for you? You were very reluctant and was understandably so. But once you did it, um, you fought back and a lot of people were relieved and actually grateful to you for like, thank you for putting that guy in his, his place. It's very, it's very challenging for men because we want to be peaceful. And, um, but sometimes we're pushed to the point where, what do we do? How do we be more Christ-like, if you will, <laughs> depending on what you're, or Buddha-like or whatever your religion is, how do, or spirituality, how do you become this way when you have other people who are just asking for it, if you will? Boy, that's a loaded question. Um, well, it started obviously in military school where I had to scrape and, and fight and everything else. And during that process, I met this guy who had long hair. Uh, he was a hippie. I didn't know much about hippies or long hair. And he started educating me about what was going on in the outside world uh, for the peace movement. And the more he talked, the more it resonated with me. And one night we decided the next morning we're going to run away. And that's when I discovered that I feel somebody hung him. He didn't commit suicide. 
Um, so when I went to the private school and his bully, as you mentioned, started up on me, uh, the first day there, he said, I hear you went to military school. I said, right. He said, did they teach you how to kill? I said, they did. He said, stand up. I want to see you beat me up. And I said, look, just leave me alone. I'm not into, I'm not into fighting. I'm not into killing anybody. Um, I just want to be left alone. I'm into peace. And he started smacking me and spitting on me to try to provoke me and I wouldn't do it. And it took three years before I finally lost it because I was up for co-captain of the soccer team. And uh, he said, he's not even willing to stand up for himself. Why should we have him? And that's what triggered me. And then uh, he knocked me down three times and I kicked him where it hurt and jumped on top of him and tried to pull his eyes out basically. And the whole team had to take me off him because I probably would have killed him. And I was that angry about this whole thing. And um, after that, I realized when I realized everyone was so happy and elated that I fought him, I thought this world really is sick. I mean, if you have to do physical damage to somebody to get respect, there's something screwy. And I needed to find other people to hang out with and, and resonate with. And so yeah. I went off and looked for the hippies. You know, it's interesting because this same character, you run into him after you kind of were making your way in, in the Hollywood world and you ran into him on a plane and he was, he was drunk and um, you confronted him and um, he basically said he was sorry and you felt bad for him. And then you learned that uh, sometime later he had passed. Yeah, I did. But uh, just a side note, when he was bullying me, I used to pray every night that something horrible would happen to him to give him a feeling of what I went through with him. And when I saw him on the plane and we connected, he said, we didn't like each other, did we? And I said, I still don't like you for what you did. And so when we got down to the baggage claim, I looked at him and said, what happened to you? You're, you're a drunk. What, what happened? He goes, well, two weeks before I got married, my fiance fell off a ladder and killed herself. And right there, I thought, did I cause that? I mean, did, did I pray so hard that it happened? And then I had to come to terms with it and realize I had nothing to do with it. But I hugged him and said, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. And I gave him my card and said, let's get together and never heard from him again, but I saw him in a film. And then I heard years later that he had passed away. So I'm glad in a macabre way, I'm glad I got a chance to see him and uh, complete that, make amends and, and forgive him. Um, and, and then so, I had to learn to forgive myself. And it's so important. Um, it's a really, uh, you know, a, a raw story that you tell, John, and it's inspirational because you got through it and look where you are right now. And um, you, uh, what, the other thing I had in my thought I had when I finished the book was that, you know, your mom, you, t you kept telling her what was going on at military school and she didn't believe you and pretty much just ignored you. And you're like, get me out of here. You can't believe what they're doing to me. And she just let it go, to go on. Yet you made peace with her uh, before she passed. How did, how did that come about? I mean, it must have been tough for you. Were you angry with your mother? Well, growing up, I was horribly angry with her. I felt that she didn't love me. I felt she wanted me out of the house so she could hang out with a new boyfriend. Um, hindsight, it's a whole different story, but I'll, I'll kind of give you the path leading up to it, is because my dad had died and my mom never really talked about it, I sat her down one night and I said, I really have questions about my father. And she said, it's very painful to talk to you about him, but I'll make you a deal. I said, what's that, mom? She said, I will answer all of your questions if we end it right now. I will tell you everything you want to know, but after that, I never want to talk again. I said, deal. So we were talking about that. And then I said, you know, I got to also tell you, when you left the train station um, and, and the train was pulling out and your image was getting smaller and smaller, you turned away. I felt like you really hated me. And she burst out crying, said, I turned away because I was crying that I was letting my little boy go. And she said, I had no choice. I had no visible support. I had no money. I was pregnant with a fourth child and miscarried at your father's funeral. And I, I had to leave you there. I honestly, John, I suspected that some of what you were telling me, if not all was true, but I couldn't do anything about it because I didn't have the, the luxury of having people at the house and helping you and you needed a lot of help and you needed discipline and the courts gave me a choice, either military school or they were gonna send you to reform school. So I was kind of stuck. I had nothing. And I took her in my arms and we cried together. And uh, it, it made me realize what she went through. And it wasn't me trying to be a victim anymore. It was trying to understand my mother and her circumstance. And later when I became a parent, it all came very clear what that process is. 
and the sacrifices you make as a parent. So I'm, I'm really so thankful and blessed that I got to do that with my mom. Okay. John Callis, my very special guest on Guys Guys Radio. We're talking about kind of men growing up, growing up uh, without your dad, having troubles with your mom, having to go to uh, deal with loss and abandonment and uh, just challenges along the way. And John's gotten through it. He's done a great job. The name of the book is When the Rain Stops. Um, let's get into it a little more because things changed for you. And uh, you met one guy, I think his name was OB, and um, you learned to, to meditate and you meditated with him and you had a mantra, uncover, discover, recover. What did, uh, and more and more guys now are waking up. I meditate every morning at 6 a.m. I've been doing it for over a year now. I never miss a day. It's made a huge change in my life in a really positive way. I had done it sporadically in the past. What did, do you meditate now? What did meditation do to you, for you? And talk about your experience with opening up to the more, let's put it in quotes, uh, spiritual side of life. Well, I had to find a path to, to heal all the, the, the damage. And OB was very instrumental. He guided me through all sorts of experiences spiritually that um, led me to, to being able to meditate. And for me, the idea of meditation became uh, John time. I was allowed to have my own time. I could selfishly say, I'm not going to serve or do anything for anybody. This is my time. And I would play games with my mind saying things, you know, what I wanted to learn in the meditation. And one night um, I had this big fight with myself saying, um, I'm pretty much in control of everything in my life now. And the voice said, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. I said, well, you smoke cigarettes, you, you can't control that. And for 20 minutes, I went back and forth. And when I came out of the meditation, I went over, grabbed my pack of cigarettes after smoking for 10 years, threw them in the garbage and never had another cigarette. So I think it gives you a foundation of calmness where there's craziness all around you it gives you a chance to unplug it's it's to me it's like going on vacation robert you know you go on vacation you finally can download get away from all the nutsness you lay on a beach or, or go to museums whatever pleases you and you get a chance to to feel that you're alive you're not living to work and work to live but you're alive you're breathing you have no responsibilities in a sense and you kind of convert back to being a kid and I think that's what meditation does for me. It kind of leads me in that direction of being able to reassess, push the reset button, calm the F down and just find out that it's nothing that important in life, especially when you lose a sibling or a parent. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gives you a whole different feel about life. Do you uh, still meditate? I do. Not every day, but I do. Um, I'll sit in my backyard sometimes when it gets crazy and I'll close my eyes and I'll see what I can hear. And that, that distracts me from thinking. So I'm trying to listen and then that fades out and then I relax. Sometimes I even fall asleep, I get so relaxed. Now the theater changed your life. Uh, you had some theater studies around the time you were palling around with OB and I think you lived out uh, somewhere more out in a more of a uh, woodsy type uh, atmosphere and, um, and you got exposed to the theater. Tell us what happened and uh, how, that if, how, did, how that changed your life in a very dramatic way. Okay. Um, I started college out as a chemistry major. And after I think two or three semesters, maybe two, um, my teacher took me for a walk and he put his arm around me and said, why are you even in chemistry? And I told him my dad died of cancer and I want to cure it. He goes, I thought it was something like that. He goes, look, you're an A student. You do three hour labs in 45 minutes. I can't tell you, you're a great guy and, and you're smart but you're not a chemistry uh, kind of guy and uh, you're out of my class. I said, you just told me I was great. And he goes, you're not a chemist, you're an artist, go find yourself. So that afternoon I was sitting on, on uh, the grass in school and my friend Liz, African-American gal came and said, what's the matter? And I told her what was going on. She goes, hey, maybe you can help me out since you're not doing anything. I said, what's that? She goes, we're doing a, a play and I need somebody just to read lines. If that's what I said, no, I'm not an actor. She goes, it's not acting. You just come read lines with me, help me out. You're not doing anything. You're not even a chemistry major anymore. So I went over and I was reading lines on, uh, with the rest of the cast. And about an hour in, I turned to the director and I said, hey, listen, I gotta go do my homework. Um, yeah, but thanks a lot. I appreciate the experience. He said, you can't leave. You're, you're the lead in this play. And I look at Liz and she had this big smile on her face. I said, we're gonna talk later. And after that, I just felt like I found the right people. They were loving people. And it was a mix of heterosexuals and gays and everything. 
Uh, and I just felt like there was a, a foundation of love there and creative support. And so I started with the theater there in um, first or second year of college. And I wrote a play that they performed at parents' teachers weekend. And I just got it in my blood. And then I decided to go out to Colorado and get into the theater there. Uh, and this guy, Joey Favre, had a, a theater called the Third Eye Theater, and he refused to accept any, any interns or anything. It was a New Yorker. And when I met him, I looked around, he goes, what are you looking? I said, this is a shithole. You need me more than I need you. He goes, what are you talking about? My teacher who introduced me just panicked. She goes, oh, I can't believe he did that. But because of that, he liked me. And he says, you're from New York, aren't you? I said, yep. And you're from New York. And he said, yep. And so he said, you know, I like your, you've got some balls and uh, let's work together. And from there, I, I started working with him. We rebuilt the theater. I became an actor. Uh, I was doing lighting with him. I helped him in all our areas of the theater and it just got in my blood. So I came out to Los Angeles to Occidental College to get my master's degree in theater arts where I met a guy who was in film and I wanted to make that transition and he helped me into the film business. Okay, for... Um... Those who uh, want to follow a similar path, it can be tricky. And as you describe, Hollywood is kind of a disingenuous yet a wonderful place. Tell us about why you say that and what the uh, uninitiated uh, need to know along the way of their journeys into La La Land. Well, the lore of attraction for uh, filmmakers or wannabe filmmakers is that they seem to feel this glorious and glamorous part to this. And to some degree there is, but coming into the film business, you have to have a pretty thick skin. You have to be tenacious and you have to be creative in how you're gonna find a job. And then you've got to get involved in a circle of people that are always working and you try to parlay with them and help them, you help them. Uh, and you help each other through these things. Um, it was not easy at all. I had no contacts whatsoever. Um, I knew no one in the business, but I just wasn't going to give up. And then one night I was living in Venice and I was looking at the twinkling stars in the distance and I broke out laugh, uh, crying and I fell on my bed thinking I'm a complete utter failure. Uh, I can't get in into the business. So I want to get in and it's killing me and blah, blah, blah. And I jumped out of bed. I said, you're not a failure. You got to find another way. And I started coming up with all these creative ways to get into auditions and or places that would take me to work in the business. Um, if you want to be a filmmaker, be sure this is what you want to be. If you're looking to get in it because of the money, go away. You're not going to make it. It's not. It's too hard of a business. Um, yes, it is disingenuous. Um, there's a lot of phony people that'll tell you, I love you and be stabbing you in the back. You have to be aware. You have to have situational awareness. You have to be smart. Um, and you have to try to look for the people you want to work with that'll take care of you. And that's what I went after. Um, it seems like from my... Uh kind of uh, meetings I've had with my, the screenplay I have of my novel that uh, the film business is a money business. It's a financial business. And that seems to be the key. And then you look at a lot of movies being made now and it's like so many different production companies uh, linked together that everybody's putting a little bit of uh, cash into the pr production. How important, and let's just talk about movies. How important is the financing to making a movie versus the actual script itself? Well, without the money, there's nothing you can do. It's paramount. So a lot of young filmmakers that put packages together, go into investments and say creative stuff and create this and create that. They don't want to know that. They, what they're, they're money people. What they want to know is if I put in a dollar, how am I going to get my money back and how am I going to get a profit on this and in what period of time? And you can't say, well, you know, it's, it's this. And they want to know concrete. <clears throat> the catch-22 is... You might have this wonderful cast in mind, but no agent's going to talk to you unless you have the money to, to make a pay or play kind of deal. So otherwise, agents would be writing letters all day long. You know, my client's interested in it, blah, blah, blah. And they know you'd be raising money on their name. That doesn't happen. They'll, they'll hang up on you if, if you don't have money. Um, so money is a driving factor. Uh, it is a business above everything. Within the business, there are creative people doing creative things. But without the financing, I mean, Spielberg was asked a question. He said, you used to make little films as, uh, as a kid. What's changed now that you're making big movies? And he said, the budget. And what he meant by that, he went on to talk about it. He said, 
the bigger budget, you have better stars, you have better production value, you got more time to work. You can do creative stuff that only financing is going to do. You uh, uh, produced a lot of, uh, you did some video work. You got some awards for Smuggler's Blues, the Glenn Fry video, pretty well known from his stint on my Miami Vice. And you were doing some production uh, and directing in the kind of the heyday of MTV. What was that like? Uh, it was incredible because at that time it was a very open and creative environment and we weren't controlled by anything uh, studio wise because it was new and nobody really knew what they were doing except the filmmakers. We understood the process and everything and I don't know if it's changed or anything because I don't make MTV videos anymore but it was a lot of fun and it was a great place to cut your teeth in learning how to do um, you know setups and learning how the, the Financials impacted the creative. Uh, working with Glenn uh, Fry from the Eagles was phenomenal experience. Uh, and we won best concept of the year at the second annual MTV awards uh, for that piece. Um, and it just went from there. You know, I started getting a reputation of uh, if it's complicated and you can't figure it out, call Callis, he'll figure it out no matter what. And that, it's just my brain works that way. I love puzzles and it, it just all became a big puzzle to me. And I just had to start finding places to plug the holes. Um, television, uh, it's kind of a different animal from my understanding than, than the film business where you need a showrunner and it has some of the similarities but it's not as financially driven because you, you may have a network or a cable network or Netflix or whoever involved. What, what is the difference for our listeners and people who are interested in the business that they need to know and what do they need to know about TV projects versus film projects? Well, TV is very similar to film, and I'm not going to undercut it. The financing, even if it's a studio or a network, is still critical because they have a finite amount of money per episode, let's say, and they don't want to overspend that because otherwise the budget's just going to keep going and growing and growing, and then they're, they're out of a lot of money. Um, when I did Bobby's World, uh, I was brought in because the first time they did it, they had done it backwards. They had shot Howie first instead of the animation. And so there was some eyeline problems and I went in and fixed it. And then after that, you know, they would call me and say, okay, we have another set of uh, six or eight episodes. Um, what's it gonna cost? And I would give them a budget. We'd talk about it and I'd explain the numbers. And, um, and they always accepted it because they knew I would give them what they needed and it would always work. Because after the first episode of the series, they came to me and said, the editors are in love with you because everything's matching up perfectly. And I said, well, thank you. I, you know, I'm here to do a good job for you. Now, with your um, experience uh, shooting commercials, I come from an advertising and marketing background. I worked at Young and Rubicam and uh, Marathi Puris Lintas and Margiotis Fertitta Partners, Agent 16, a whole bunch of ad agencies. We shot a lot. Of, a lot. My first ad that we shot was the director was Michael Bay. <laughs> and wow. He had a very small budget. And he didn't even want to talk to anybody. But um, <laughs> your discipline, I would think, from being able to, you know, creating advertising requires discipline because you have a finite amount of time to tell a story and get that point across and sell some product. How did, uh, tell us about that experience and how that impacted your being able to be such an efficient filmmaker. Well, prior to me getting into commercials, a lot of it was kickballing and scrambling. You know, you throw a light up and you shoot something, move on. When I got into commercials, it was a whole different world. It, they took each frame, each storyboard frame, as if it was a Monet, a painting. And they sat there and they made the lights work. And, and I started understanding, think, wow, these people really have a grip of quality in filmmaking. It's not just throw shit at the window. And they would spend hours getting something just the way they wanted. And that to me started opening up my mindset of filmmaking. If you apply those 30 second spots into a film, that's why the budgets are big because the big directors like Ridley Scott that came out of commercials, um, understood the quality of the film he was creating and he's not gonna let something look like crap. You know, He will work at it till it's right. And he's got a very specific style in his films and he goes after it. Same with Spielberg, same with Scorsese and all the other great directors. And I think that really opened my eyes up to, um, I'm not gonna do things that I can't put my name to and feel good about the quality. And that changed the whole course of the way I, uh, I went about doing my business after that. So um, you, you worked with a lot of A-list stars on different projects, everything from trailers to the videos and to other, other you know, assistant production 
roles and titles and all types of things. What was some of the highlights and who were the biggest stars you worked with and were they everything that they were cracked up to be? Well, Jack Nicholson came to the set and of course everyone was nervous and I just walked up and said, hi, my name's John. He said, Jack. He said, what do I need to do? And we sat and talked about it and he was incredibly cooperative and a gentleman. Mel, Mel uh, Gibson uh, came to a set that we were shooting a trailer for and he walked on and he put his hand on and he goes, hi, my name's Mel. And I said, I'm John. And I took him to the dressing room and the guy was a sweetheart, a gentleman to the ninth degree. Mel Brooks, same thing. Although I cracked a joke and he put his arm around me and said, I'm the funny one. You don't tell jokes, I do. I said, okay, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would say all of the stars, including Eddie Murphy that I worked with uh, uh, and, and the others that I mentioned plus others, um, I think they're professionals and they were there to do a job and they weren't there to be fancy stars. And um, it made for a really good environment on, on my sets. And, How about, uh, I'm very good. okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's all right, go ahead. Um, I was just, before I forget, Bill Wyman of the Rolling Stones, what did you do with him? Uh, I did one of his uh, music videos and he was a hoot to work with, he was really cool. I mean, cause you got a Rolling Stone there, you, you know, you think he could become a little bit of a diva, nope. He was just there, ate with us, talked like a normal person. And uh, that kind of gave me a nice insight in the music world of these people are just people too. You know, I mean, sometimes we over idolize people because they can play a guitar or sing or something. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to bring it down to earth. Uh, Grace Slick from Jefferson Starship. She and I had such a laugh on the set. She, you know, so I gave her a big hug and we took pictures together and, uh, I just had a good time. They trusted me and they let me do my, my work. Okay. Um, John Callis, my special guest on Guys Guys Radio. We're talking about Hollywood now, but let's let's pivot back to your, uh, your books. You've got another book um, that you uh, have a package put together for production. It's called Christmas Voices. It's, uh, it's kind of an upbeat. Uh, it's like uh, the, what's the book with Jimmy Stewart? The Christmas, uh, you, you explain it. I'm the one allowed well, to It's job. a cross between It's a Wonderful <laughs> Life and A Christmas Carol. It's, it's a, a, a modern day Scrooge. And the reason I wrote this book was primarily because I looked around the planet and saw that people have kind of lost their moral compass and don't understand the value of things such as family. And so we, I start the book when he was very young and poor, goes through a very wealthy phase, um, forgets what the value is based on this village that he used to build, and eventually is family gets in a terrible car accident and probably not going to live. He starts building the village at a guilt, gets really drunk, falls asleep on the table and winds up inside the village with no money and no power. And he remembered the promises as a kid he made to the villagers that he was going to be powerful and help them with all of their problems. Now he had to figure out how to do that without money and in order to get back out of the village. And so at the end, it's a very happy ending. Everyone lives and, you know, he becomes very generous and builds a village for his family and I think it's just really heartfelt. I just love the story. Okay, we've got two last questions and I think they're important ones, particularly for Guys Guys Radio. For parents out there uh, who have young boys, let's talk about that because we're both guys and I have a son and you have sons and what's the most important thing to know and be aware of, particularly because you had a completely different set of experiences than, than I had. I've had my challenges, of course, but as we all do, but as parents now, what do we, what do parents need to know about raising boys nowadays, in your opinion? I think they need to understand that prior generations have taught boys and uh, to not feel, you know, you can't cry. You're a man, stand up, pull up your pants, you know, uh, you know, your sister cries, you don't cry. And I think now people are starting to realize that boys do have feelings and they need to be encouraged to talk about them. So I think parents need to understand that it's okay for boys to cry, um, you know, you, appropriately. I mean, you don't want them crying, you know, because they hurt their nose or something, you know, <laughs> you know, or your sister stole a pen. So uh, I think they need to teach them a little bit more of the sensitivities of life, um, give them good direction. Uh, look, guys and, and girls are quite different species. It's, it's just the way it is. I'm not saying that we're not equal, but it's different. Women are very nurturing. Guys tend to go out for the hunt. You know, we're hunters, you know, hunt for a job. We try to bring home the bacon, so to speak. But in that uh, old fashioned thinking, it stifles the parents because they don't know what to do with this boy 
because he's got emotions. So now it's more of, if you're a parent with a boy, you need to, to find out if he needs help. And therapy might be a good choice. You know, talking to him is a great choice, but most important, listening. We tend not to listen. When our kids are saying something, say, so, well, yeah, but this, you know, and we, we get uncomfortable maybe with them trying to express something and we try to push them in a different direction when we need to stop and listen to their needs. They have their own path like we do as parents and we need to listen. And that to me is the most important thing. Okay, for uh, those uh, who want to get into Hollywood, what are the three traits, that, the most helpful traits to have as individuals to, to have a best chance of um, success? Okay, um, tenacity, don't ever burn a bridge. Um, and when you finally get on the set, if you do as a production assistant, keep your eyes open and your mouth shut and don't think you should be in the director's chair the third day on the set. And don't try to tell people, you know, oh, that's, you know, I would have done it differently. Keep quiet and learn from every experience and slowly find ways to get yourself into the next step. You know, if you're on the set as a PA for God knows how long, maybe you go to your production manager, you work with and say, hey, is there any chance I could be like assistant to the assistant coordinator or something? And you get an opportunity there and then you work your way up to a coordinator and so on and so forth. Now, the biggest piece of advice I'd give to young people that want to get in the business, decide if you want to be an independent or a studio. If I had to do my whole life over again, I'd start at the studio. That's where the money is. That's where the distribution is. That's where the power is. And yeah, it may be a little bit slower pace. Um, and you may not be able to get to do all the things you do as an independent, but being an independent, it's mind boggling how hard it is to, to find money. And when you do to get it up and running, and then you got to go through distribution. And if you don't have the right cast, you get pushed down to the side and you can't get in the theaters because the big films are there. It's a whole different world. So you got to make up your mind where you want to go, either studio or independent. I would suggest go in studio, become a, a page, Get in there, just become an office assistant, whatever it takes, and get your name known as the kid that's cooperating and will do anything for the job. Great stuff, John. So uh, tell everybody where they can find uh, you and uh, your books real quick. My book, my books all, all are on Amazon.com. Uh, JohnCallis.com is my website. If you can't find it on, on Amazon, you can go to my website and click through and it'll put you on Amazon. Um, there is also, if you going back to Christmas voices, if you go on YouTube and, um, just search, uh, time lapse, Christmas voice, uh, Christmas village, John Callis, you'll see, uh, the village that my wife and I have developed over the years. It's three and a half feet wide and 20 feet long hand carved mountains, trains, and all that. So it's a great thing to see. Um, but yes, uh, uh, Amazon is the main place and all of my books are listed there. Great. Well, listen. Uh, good stuff. I think we uh, hopefully tar uh, your story will help um, inspire people, um, look more inside, understand that the challenges that boys have, uh, not just today, but yesterday and into the future, that it's not that easy to be a guy. And most of the focus is on, um, is not on the guys right now. And I think it's important, though, that we look after them and help them become men. And I think uh, your story can really help that. And I think you have a lot of positive things to say. I will disagree with you on one point though, and that is a lot of women nowadays are bringing home the bacon and more. So more power to I them I didn't also. say they didn't. I didn't say they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I don't want to get any pitchforks at me. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> but Robert, I did do something interesting on Instagram. I posted when the rain stops and I said, if you're having a problem and you read my book and you want to talk, direct message me. And this woman messaged me and I spent an hour and a half on the phone with her. And at the end, she said, you know what? I feel like my mother's alive and she's channeling through you because you're telling me stuff that she would have told me. And it kind of touched my heart deeply, you know? So good, good if for you. your viewing audience reads the book and somebody out there just would like to talk a little bit because they have nobody else to talk to, feel free to reach out to me, um, johncallisofficial at gmail.com. Or again, go on my website, www.johncallis.com and you can reach me that way. Fantastic. Well, good job, John, and good job in, in the bigger game, which is life, way beyond Guys Guys Radio, because, uh, you know, your experiences and the way you articulated them and gotten through them are inspirational. So thank you for being a Guys Guy. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate you having me on your show. If you enjoy the guests and content I bring you each and every week on Guys Guys Radio and TV, please support us by subscribing to our channels. Thanks.